right. Welcome everyone. This is a monthly WECO webinar learning series we call Getting Started in Accessibility. And it is uh, a free service of our company, Digital Accessibility by WECO, formerly known as WECO Accessibility Services. So just a few business things I need to get out of the way before we get going is that the information that is found in this presentation are tips based upon the experiences and the advice, uh, sorry, I'm switching screens, <laughs> opinions and experiences of digital accessibility by WECO staff and should not be construed as legal advice regarding the development and implementation of digital accessibility practices, it is advisable to seek the advice of qualified legal counsel. The information in this presentation is the property of the Wehrman Collaborative LLC, or our fancy legal name for digital accessibility by WECO. So please ask us before distributing this information, and you can do that by contacting us through our website or at access info at the wico.com. Thank you. Accessibility note. Uh, and you can go ahead and advance the slide, Debbie. Thank you. This presentation has built into it audio description for non-visual users, which is just simply part of our narration. So for instance, this, this slide shows our title of the presentation and our brand new logo, which we're excited about, which is our word WECO. And the letter O is fashioned as a wheelchair and it has a stick person or what we call our rider sitting in it. There's also a teal star that we've added to the bat, to the front of the word WECO and the words digital accessibility above it. There's also a logo for the International Association of Accessibility Professionals because we are a member. And that is the letters IAAP with the words spelled out below it and member in a little circle below it. So our logo will be on most of the slides for this presentation, but there will also be some other visual aids um, that we will explain as part of how we're presenting. Next slide. First, a little bit more about us. We are a, WECO is a company of digital accessibility professionals with a mission to put you in touch with SMEs who live with disabilities. So as we stated, we are members of the IAAP and we also provide rigorous training for our people. This slide shows a WECO accessibility specialist using screen magnification software in an accessibility audit. The IAAP logo is above him with the words because simulations can't replace human experiences. You'll be hearing this a lot more from us as WECO is where disabilities are lived, not simulated. A little bit more about me. My name is Lynn Wehrman. I am the founder and president of Digital Accessibility by WECO. The slide shows my picture and I am also appearing on camera today. I am a petite blonde woman, I identify as female and I have my geek glasses on today. My pronouns are, pronouns are she, her. I began this journey as a federal program coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. My communications background led me down a road to become one of the very first government accessibility professionals. So I'll be speaking from that experience with you today. Now, a bit about this webinar. Instead of me simply talking and you listening, we encourage you to go ahead. We're a small group. These are usually small webinars. Uh, and text over questions and thoughts in the text box during the presentation. I'm going to do my best to keep chat tabs on that chat box and answer your questions right away and integrate them into the presentation. But if you do prefer, there will be open discussion at the end. This slide shows an illustration of office workers talking together. Some are standing, some are in wheelchairs, others are using crutches. So 
let's dive right into the topic. What does digital accessibility mean? So in its most essential form, digital accessibility means that people living with disabilities, <clears throat> excuse me, can easily access the same information as users who do not live with disabilities. So this includes people whose disabilities may require them to use digital accessibility devices such as screen readers. But it's really important to note that there are many of us who live with disabilities who do not use special devices for computer use. We're going to discuss that more in the slides to come. This slide shows a photo of hands resting on a Braille laptop. The most common, excuse me a minute, I'm frogging my throat. <clears throat> the most common issues and with digital accessibility are found in HTML code that is not properly identified and when content management choices don't recognize the needs of users living with disabilities. This slide shows a photo of a person pushing against a large hand, the sun is setting in the background. But digital accessibility, it's important to note, is more than just blindness. We can get a little fixated on this type of disability and may allow the needs of people with other disabilities to fall by the wayside. I know that's what happened to me when I started to work on my first website accessibility project for the state of Minnesota, because it was the most difficult for me to grasp at that time. And I had a mentor, very fortunately, who constantly reminded me that there are more disabilities than just blindness. Lynn. So in truth, people living with blindness and low vision are just part of the pictures of disabilities that can impact how we use computers. As this chart from the most recent available US Census Bureau indicates, 19.9 <clears throat> .9 million people in the United States live with mobility disabilities. 15.2 million people live with cognitive disabilities and 8.1 million people live with blindness, while 7.6 million people live with a hearing disability. And these demographics are only for the United States. So worldwide, we have, of course, larger numbers than this. It is a lot of people to consider. So this uh, shows the chart with the before mentioned demographics. Digital accessibility is also the law, both in the United States and in much of the world, such as in Canada, Europe, and Asia. If your company does business in another country, you may find accessibility is becoming important on a global scale. The two primary United States laws that govern accessibility are the Americans with Disabilities Act, also called the ADA. The ADA is often associated with building access, uh, ramps into building, how we're able to access bathrooms and public facilities. But it's important to know that this law covers any area of public use. Anything that is open to the general public to use is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that includes websites. The ADA applies to everyone also, not just government. That is private businesses, small businesses, corporations, nonprofits, also other public organizations that we may not think would be covered like churches. Or if you have a neighborhood book club and you have a website for it, and I realize there is no money changing hands there, but if that information is out for the public to consume, it falls under equal access with the ADA. The second form of legislation here in the US that we comply with is called the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 508. This one's usually puzzling to people because the law itself predates the internet but it's often referred to the Section 508 part because this was written as the most earliest and prescriptive website accessibility guidance that we had in the United States. 
So Section 508, however, applies only to government. And that includes any state or local government who may be using federal dollars and businesses and individuals who are selling digital products to governments. So Section 508 was refreshed in 2017 with the guidance that we will discuss next. The slide is showing a keyboard with one of the keys replaced by an American flag. Next, we'll discuss the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. People pronounce this as WCAG or WCAG. And these are standards that were developed by the Web Accessibility Initiative, or WAI, of the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C. This is an independent group of web professionals focused on increasing the accessibility and usability of the web around the world. WCAG guidelines are a list of extremely specific code and content management suggestions for improving digital accessibility for users who live with disabilities. WCAG is presently divided into two levels, 1.0 and 2.0. The higher the number, the more inclusive the guideline level. WCAG is also subdivided into A, AA, and AAA substandards. Again, the more letters, the more inclusive the substandard. What makes WCAG so significant in regard to US and international accessibility laws is that it is viewed as a highly reliable guideline. In some countries, WCAG is being made part of existing accessibility laws, and in others, it is helping to create accessibility laws. For instance, in the United States, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was refreshed in 2017. The refresh incorporated WCAG 2.0 AA standards into the law. And we know that a reshaping of the Americans with Disabilities Act to include more prescriptive digital accessibility requirements was planned to be announced back in 2017. And then the DOJ removed the requirements altogether. That was a different White House administration. They had a very, very different view on disability rights. So since a new administration has come on board, things have changed. And as you all know, we have released very uh, generalized uh, rules for uh, ADA web guidance that came out just very recently. And they are not prescriptive. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So the US Access Board contacts that we are aware of uh, had told us at the time when the, the ADA web rules were not to be released that we should look to WCAG 2.0 AA. And we know that that is the adopted version of the US Access Board. And the European Union has also adopted version 2.1 AA. The W3C is working on releasing its latest version 2.2. And it is taking longer than expected for a number of reasons. We actually have a, a uh, post out in our social media on that. Uh, we also have a blog on our website about that that you could certainly check out. So this slide is just showing the W3C logo. So what I'd like to wrap up with on the ADA piece is that there are a lot of thoughts on why the ADA release was not more prescriptive. And we actually sponsored a meetup on this earlier this month and had someone who's on our advisory board who is very well versed in digital accessibility law who stated that he believes they may be withholding per prescriptive guidance simply because technology is changing so fast and so frequently. And that it, it just may be uh, a need to hold off until they can get certain things on the same page. Um, I know the US Access Board likes to keep the laws aligned, Section 508 and ADA. 
So there are some very specific reasons that most of us can only guess at as why specific guidance wasn't released on that. We're happy to talk to you about that in the discussion part. So we're gonna go into a little bit less of the law and more about the people next. According to the US Department of Human Services, the disabilities that we all live with fall into four primary classifications, mobility or motor skill, cognitive, hearing, and sight-related disabilities. This slide is showing a tile with symbols for each classification. So let's get into talking about some of the people who work with us who live with these disabilities and how they manifest themselves. So I'd like you to meet Chad. Chad is one of WECO's senior testers. He lives with a mobility-related disability. He has limited use of his hands or limited fine motor skills. So Chad will use speech recognition software, pointer sticks, like the one that he has uh, he has strapped to his wrist that he's demonstrating so that he can select just one key at a time. And he will also use st sticky keys for keyboard navigation. Chad will also use a tablet with large tiles on it for a mobile device that works pretty well for him. Next slide. When people live with limited fine motor skills, using a mouse or a keyboard can be really problematic and tiring for them, especially when you think about the time it takes for our hands to travel from a mouse to a keyboard back and forth. If you have limited mobility, that can be very tiring. It can also be extremely challenging if you are working on a website that has timing mechanisms, such as bank forms or airline reservation forms. And that also, when we have websites that are extremely clickable or mouse dependent, that can be a real hurdle for someone living with a mobility disability. So if they have to click to get into everything, if they have to uh, uh, also scrolling through numerous pages, that can also be very physically tiring. Next slide. Oh, this shows a, a person, sorry, <laughs> we're showing a, a very unique type of mouse and uh, keyboard navigation um, tray that is part of someone's keyboard. This is Chelsea. Chelsea is a week of tester who lives with an intellectual disability. She finds it's much easier to use mobile devices as mobile devices, mobile formats are simplified. Uh, this was something that we noticed after working with Chelsea when we noticed that she didn't have a desktop or a laptop and she didn't want to have one. She did all her testing with us through phone and through her tablet. Chelsea doesn't have a specialized device. She's a really good example of a user like myself who lives with a cognitive disability and doesn't use a, a, a device. The design considerations are our accommodation tool. And this is, slide shows Chelsea seated in a chair. So people who live with cognitive disabilities may encounter a wide array of difficulties on websites, software, or mobile apps. And I think it's important to know Many of our new customers will say things to me like, well, we don't really have to worry about cognitive disabilities. And that's when we take out the slide and explain to them that they do. Because people who live with depression or dyslexia, and I, I have a severe form of depression that crops up on me uh, at least a couple times a year. And during those times, like a person with dyslexia, I can find it very difficult to read dense content or um, pages that that are not crafted in an easy to read style. Users with attention deficit disorder may be easily distracted by things like rotating picture carousels or moving graphics. We have someone on our team who lives with attention deficit disorder and he was just saying that there was a website that he could, he just stayed away from because there was no way to turn off the picture carousels. It drove him nuts. So that is a very real thing. 
for people with seizure disorders like epilepsy, website page flicker and flashing graphics can trigger seizures. Having grown up in a family where I and my four sisters were born with epilepsy, I know that this can be life-threatening. People living with traumatic brain injury or an intellectual disability may also find it difficult to comprehend technical or wordy content. So as I said, I live with a cognitive disability, including uh, chronic clinical depression. And in my experience, it can be very difficult to read information online at times um, for all of these above reasons. So it's just an important thing to realize that this is kind of a wide category to get your arms around. But really, when you think about good sound design considerations that you learned when you were first a developer or a UXer, those are usually the things that work best for those of us in this category. This slide shows a person at a computer with a phone held to his ear, his eyes are closed, and his forehead is leaning on his hand. This is Kate. And Kate is actually one of our retired testers uh, who still allows us to use her picture because she, she was very photogenic. <laughs> and she lives with a congenital hearing condition. She can hear sounds at certain pitches, but has difficulty picking up conversation. So for instance, Kay can hear music really well, but she cannot hear conversation very well. So that is just one of the nuances of how people's hearing disabilities can be very different from person to person. She uses two hearing aids and occasionally a sound amplification device like the one she is modeling in this picture. Like Chelsea, Kate doesn't use a computer specific device for accessibility. She depends upon accessible design as her aid. Next slide. For most people living with hearing related issues, difficulties will only arise if sound is involved, unless of course they have a dual disability. If being able to hear a sound is the only way that a person can receive the information that's offered, that's going to create an obstacle for them. These individuals can overcome their hearing problems with a number of ways. So some may use a cochlear implant, which is basically a hearing aid that is surgically inserted into the ear. Um, some people like Kate use a traditional hearing aid, but these all may or may not help depending upon uh, where their hearing condition is at. So that's why it's important to make sure that we don't convey things by sound alone. Um, it's also important to note that some people who live with a hearing disability may rely upon sign language. And for some people, sign language is their first language. Uh, and I think I have a slide on that next. No, I do not. Okay, other presentation. So the ASL interpretation is an important thing to understand because when I was developing sites for the state and I was the contact, the accessibility contact, I would get complaints from people who were ASL fluent as a first language. And I did not understand that it was a different sentence structure. So it took some understanding and learning on my part to understand how to meet the needs of those users by understanding that their sentence structure was different. Just something important to know. Last, we'd like to, dis like to uh, introduce you to Nina. Nina is one of our principal testers, one of our top testers and she lives with a sight-related disability. Nina became blind at age 14 and she is a very skilled JAWS screen reader user. She may also use to feel a web page through Braille, and she is demonstrating a Braille laptop here. And uh, she also uh, 
may decide to print things out in Braille and read them. We have a number of users on our team that are Braille proficient. There are actually only about 15% of the people who, who are blind in the US that choose to learn Braille. So while it's not universal, it's just important to know that that is a text alternative that your users may select. Other devices that people living with sight-related disabilities may use are enlarged keyboards. So if someone is low vision, they will be able to see the keys more easily or keyboards with tactile markings so they can touch the letters. Also, as was demonstrated in our earlier photo with one of our accessibility specialists, screen magnifying software also can make the objects on the screen appear bigger. We're really lucky in development now that it's super easy in the browser to enlarge websites. That makes it a lot easier. But it's an important consideration for, to think about when you are developing to make sure that the design is responsive so it can look good and things can make sense even when it appears large. Some of the digital barriers that people have with site-related disabilities is unmarked style components. If headings, bullet lists, numbers lists are not correctly, if they're just simply made to look like a heading, but they're not coded as a heading, that can be a problem because headings can be navigation points for people using screen reader software, for instance. Images and graphics that can't be described because there are no alt tags on them, leave people out of understanding the content through the images that are provided. And making sure that there is more than one way to complete uh, an action or to, to receive information. A really good example is drop down boxes are notoriously not coded for screen readers. And if that is the only way a person can receive or give information, that can be a problem. So having more than one choice to how people access information is good usability anyway, but it's really important for people who live with site-related disabilities. So you can go ahead and watch our testers and accessibility specialists and use their devices and talk about design considerations on our YouTube channel. We haven't quite updated the title. It still says WECO Accessibility Services, but uh, we have a, just a huge variety of screen reader demos and uh, people interacting with our testers and asking them questions you'd like to ask. So please feel free to just search us on YouTube under WECO Accessibility Services. Now we're just going to wrap up today with um, taking a look at where accessibility can fall short and why. And this is our cautionary tale, part of the presentation, because we think it's important to understand that there is really, like many things, no way uh, to get become accessible, but to actually do the work. Uh, and quick fixes um, may provide kind of a Band-Aid approach, but they, they, they don't usually provide a real accessible experience for the user. Allow me to explain. So accessibility overlays are very, very popular right now. Uh, they promise that your website is going to be instantly accessible after purchase. What they do is they insert a toolbar on top of your website that detects things like screen reader software or speech recognition software. And it forces the users using those tools into the toolbar and tells them that the only way they can access the website is through that toolbar. The problem is, is that the overlays will address only about 25% of WCAG requirements. So that leaves your website largely inaccessible after you purchase them. But they also force users to learn new software to gain access to your website, and this can take time. Those toolbars contain so many different options for the user that the user has to go through all the options to figure out which ones are best for them, select the ones that's best for them, and learn how to use it 
before they get to your website. This can, for some people, take hours. It, it quite literally can. So think about it. Um, if it's this something that you want your user to experience is a hindrance to your website so that they have to use it with a certain tool that they are totally unfamiliar with. So we actually created the cartoon for this, um, this slide, and it shows a screen reader user with her head on a desk saying another website telling me to use this toolbar instead of my screen reader. So many of our staff that are faced with this just leave those websites and they're, they're like, fine, I'm not going to be able to use it. So if you think about it, is this something that you would ask users who don't live with disabilities to do to access your website? Probably not. Well, then it's probably not a good choice for your users who live with disabilities. Overlays are really highly socially inappropriate. They limit the choices of your users. When organizations take the time to create genuine accessibility through the application of WCAG principles, they expand choices for users and allow them to use their own software and tools. So in the end, overlays are risky. They do not make your website fully accessible anyway, and they alienate users and create potential legal issues through uh, hindering people from being on your site. So we are seeing a really large uptick in digital accessibility lawsuits tied to overlays. You can certainly search that on the web. Um, and we have some blog articles on our website about that. We hope that this will help you rethink whether or not you would like to use those tools. Accessibility checkers, on the other hand, are becoming a widely available part of most of the tools that we have available to us for development and uh, even Microsoft products, even Word and PowerPoint and Outlook have checkers now. Accessibility checkers can be an excellent triage tool. And there are many open source tools out there like Wave and Google Lighthouse that you can use without even having to purchase anything. They will help you catch accessibility issues that can be detected in the code and fix them before testing with your users. Many of our clients at WECO use these tools and it really helps the, the remediation process go quickly. There are places where accessibility tools fall short, particularly in measuring the accessibility of content. For instance, does this heading make sense? Does this alt tag accurately describe what is going on in the text and, and clue in the non-visual user? Things like that are a little bit more difficult for those tools to detect. But that is why you want to include users who live with disabilities in part of your process. And we were showing a uh, screenshot of an accessibility checker in Word on this slide. Next, we're going to discuss solid steps that we recommend that you can take to get started on accessibility and to meet the online needs of your customers and users who live with disabilities. First of all, where this all starts is developing a culture of accessibility awareness. It's because accessibility is much more than a process that you develop and follow. It has to be something that is deemed important in your organization and built into everything you do. So building that culture of accessibility begins with fostering awareness about accessibility and the needs of users with disabilities. So we suggest this three-pronged approach. First, training. Provide training to your staff, including both technical needs and awareness needs surrounding the needs of people living with disabilities. This will equip them with the ability to make technical decisions that serve real people, not just meet a checklist of compliance. This training would ideally include device and disability type awareness, as well as how these play out in the lives of real people who live with disabilities. This webinar, by the way, is a really good start. Feel free to send your folks to us once a month, or you can view the recording that we have of this on our website. 
use it. It's one of our free tools that we give to you. Second, process. Focus on allowing and fostering teams and individuals to create development process standards, which include accessible practices as a daily work routine and not special circumstances or an afterthought or something you tack on to the end. Trust me, that is going to save you a lot of money and a lot of labor. <laughs> and thirdly, I'm losing my place in notes. Implementation. Empowering your teams and individuals to follow through with those accessible practices that you've crafted without obstacles like improper workflow structure or resource limitations. And we find that many of our new clients, that's where they really struggle. They are uh, given a very small budget to just get it done. And if there again, that goes back to developing a culture of accessibility, if leadership doesn't understand that accessibility needs to be a part of the daily routine and something that is just a natural part of the process, it can be really hard to have the funds allocated for this. Uh, this slide shows uh, an office worker seated at a desk, writing on a pad and looking at a computer screen. So, this leads us to the next part. How accessible are you right now? We encourage you to take advantage of WECO's free accessibility assessment. And one of the, the key things that that can do, it gives you basically a sample of what it's like to work with one of our usability testers and a sample of what it's like to have uh, a minimal audit done with our accessibility specialist and puts it together in one report. And the evil plan that you could have with this is you can take that free assessment to your leadership and you can demonstrate the need for accessibility in your organization. Many, many of our clients start out this way and that is why we offer it. It helps you build that business case. What it does is it gives you that baseline of accessibility. You hear the voice of a real user in that usability test that's built into this. And it gives you a sense of where you are right now. Are there things we're doing right that we want to keep? What things do we need to change? So you can contact us right in the chat here now, or you can sign up on the front page. Uh, almost every page of our website en enables you to sign up for a free assessment or to ask for more information. So there again, it's, a, it's just a really good opportunity to make that case. This slide shows two people working on a laptop computers and coffee and notebooks next to them. Take advantage of other free services that we have. If you go to the WECO website, theweco.com, we have our resource tab, and that is where everything is. Uh, resource will give you access to these recorded webinars, upcoming live webinar listings. Uh, it will also give you a chance to sign up for our blog and our quick tips. Quick tips is an email that we send out once a month that helps you learn accessibility a bite at a time. And the blog keeps you up to date on everything that's new and changing in digital accessibility. But also check out our services tab. The services tab will let you know what our training and consulting UX testing services, what that's all about. And you can certainly reach out to us anytime that you have questions. But I always like to say, use our free stuff. It's, it's there, and it's a great way to get started. This slide shows a woman seated at a desk with in front of a lamp and a computer screen. So at this point, we would like to open this up for discussion. Do we have any questions in the chat? There are no questions in the chat right now, Lynn. Okay. Well, I can start with a question that we usually get at these webinars. And it most often someone will bring up, I am the only person in my organization that sees a need for accessibility. How do I get other people involved? Well, let me reassure you by saying that it is very typical for 
accessibility efforts and organizations to be grassroots. They rarely do I think that we have met many people that have been CEOs or upper level management that have come to us and said, we need to get this done. It is always someone who is working in the field, working in the trenches that discovers it. It, it can, very oftentimes it can be people in marketing, it can be people in UX, it can be people in IT, but they see it. And very oftentimes it's people who have someone in their life who lives with a disability. So know that that's where most people start out. And the suggestions that we gave earlier for building that culture of awareness, I think is where you get started. There is, uh, if you have a staff meeting and you've got time for a training, you could even suggest that you play this recording of, of our training, which is on our website. You have full permission to do that. You can, you can simply play that for a staff meeting to get people educated. You know, you can even cut out our brand parts if you want, but um, go ahead and, and take, take advantage of that. And it's that building awareness. Also that getting the free assessment can be really impactful because that is concrete proof that um, things are, are not accessible. And that can be really helpful because it makes the concept much more, much less abstract to people and much more concrete. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to speak up for a small room. Anybody have any comments or questions about this new ADA guidance that's just come out? Well, I will let you know that um, we sponsor a, uh, actually a global meetup called ATC Meetup, Accessibility Twin Cities, but we have people from all over the world that belong to it. And we will be, um, it's held the last Monday of the month every other month. The next one is coming up in July. Um, and Ellen, if you, Ellen is on, if you could, could you pull that date for us, the date and time? That's a really, really good one if you want to get in on understanding the changes to WCAG. We are going to have a guest speaker, Bill Tyler, who is an accessibility professional at Optum Health, uh, part of United Health Group. He's one of our members. He's going to be presenting on version 2.2 and giving some comment on 3.0. And Ellen, when is that held? Yeah, that's at on um, July, Monday, July 25th at 5.30 p.m. Central Time. Central U.S. time, yeah. Thank you. So that is the meetup does have a paid membership, but I will uh, give you a hint on you can sign up for a 60 day trial. And if it doesn't work out, you don't have to pay for it, but you can get, get in and listen to that meetup. We design it so you can scam it. <laughs> so please do. Okay, we have a chat come in from Teresa. Okay, so Teresa says, hi, Lynn, thank you for the introduction. Uh, team, of, We're a team of occupational therapists are viewing this in New York City. Hi! <laughs> um, and we are new to digital accessibility as we're working with patients with disability and modifying physical environments. Well, Teresa, thanks so much for being here, everyone. Um, in New York City, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, it is super, super important. Uh, all of us on the WECO team have worked with physical therapists at one time or the other, and making sure that those communications are accessible is super important. So thanks for caring about that. Thanks for doing this fantastic work for all of us. Is there anything I can answer for your group? Anything you guys are wondering or any ideas that popped out? Okay. 
Well, we are a little bit past time, so we will close this. We always have a version of this on our website, which we refresh periodically. So uh, please feel free to take advantage of that recording and pass it on to others. We have other recorded webinars. There, there are a bunch of them. They're a little crazy and, and Elle and I are getting them organized, but they are out there. So there are lots of topics that you can choose from, from our free webinars. Please take advantage of those. And I would like to thank my crew. I'd like to thank uh, Debbie Heilig, who is our moderator today. And I'd like to thank Ellen DeCesar, our communications coordinator, who popped in to make sure I had all the information to give you. And we hope to see you sometime in the future. Thank you so much.